On June 2, 2012, DGP, the Center for Design and Geopolitics, held its second annual conference. Entitled Designing Geopolitics II, it was held in the Black Box Theater of Cal IT2, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology in La Jolla, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. So this is going to be an interesting discussion for this panel, I can tell already. Um, John Wilbanks is going to talk to us a little bit about where the new intermediaries come from. When there's a mismatch between an extant residual legal political form, an old legal statute, attempting to govern and contain what it can neither describe or circumscribe on the one hand, and an emergent and convergent socio-technical form, a new social network condition arising from a new technical network condition on the other, then the structural momentum of the latter may amorally and asubjectively proliferate a multitude of quote-unquote criminal connections and transferences. A critical mass of historically emergent flow will, for good or bad, overwhelm the legacy code of inherited legal lines in the sand. Now, this is different than the transgression of an active code. It's less illegal than illegal. Outside or transversal to the incommensurate legal supervision. Not exactly micro political or macro political, perhaps larval political is a better term. The emergence of modes and scales of political and collective subjectivity, neither exactly inside or outside of governance and representative democracy, and not exactly inside or outside of markets either, is elemental, perhaps, to any cosmopolitanism that we might want to, uh, uh, that we might want to imagine and anticipate. This is so even and especially if what comes next is technically illegal or extra legal or illegal by yesterday's and today's statutes. Worse than criminalization of culture, perhaps, is the criminalization of infrastructure. But such crimes, could we call them post crimes, are possibly an inevitable execution of programs provided by networks and their autonomic sovereign disregard for these zombie jurisdictions. The constitution of new jurisdictions that equitably govern an emergent social and structural flows occurs through the repetition of actions and act and processes which are necessarily transversal to those to those old to those older forms. Now, Hart and Negri, their Commonwealth thesis is parallel to this in a certain extent. Their argument, in a way, can sort of be summarized. As, uh, quickly sort of as follows, and that the part of the, dis the unexpected and perhaps paradoxical outcomes of the digitalization of the way in which capitalist economies produce the value of things is that in the digitalization of, of assets and the digitalization of resources and digitalization of files that they become in weird ways unownable. Things that used to be have exchange value no longer have exchange value. And their argument is that this process, in a way, is, a kind of, is an inversion of the old primitive accumulation, whereas something that wasn't in the market, wasn't owned or have property status, a beach, a piece of land, a genome, a, 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 so forth, is taken and made into property. This, this process, this inversion of, of this, by which things that used to be exchange value are made back to being non-property, not public property or state property, but essentially not ownable is one of the, the paradoxical conditions. Now, of course, this is happening, and some of its effects are democratizing. Other effects are impoverishing, making the monetary value of the work that is done to produce these things that don't have exchange value what we used to, by what we used to call the middle class into something that is monetized by search engines. So these processes, these demand a kind of representation. How can things, including us and the things that live inside us, be represented? What constitution, what composition do they demand? What is, this, what is their status? Um, what licenses do they require? And the terms of the license, but which allow them to participate in these processes in ways that we would see, we, we would understand as acceptable. So these are some of the things that John Wilbanks has been working on, some of the things that John Wilbanks will, will talk to us about. John Wilbanks is a senior fellow with the Ewan Marion Kaufman Foundation. He runs the Consent to Research Project. John worked at Science Commons and Creative Commons from 2004 to 2011 as Vice President of Science. He ran the Science Commons project for fi its five-year lifetime. 
and continued to work on science after he joined the core Creative Commons organization. Scientific American in 2011 featured Wilbanks in the medicine that would predict the future. Seed Magazine named Wilbanks among their revolutionary minds of 2008 as a game changer, and the Utney Reader named him it was 2009 as one of the 50 visionaries changing the world. I'm also happy, honored to be a, 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 a Libba fellow with, with John. Um, David For the director of Libba, is joining us here today. With that, it's my pleasure to give you John Wilbanks. Could we bring up the first picture, please? Uh, we don't have a clicker, so there's going to be a lot of the instruction. So this is an experimental presentation. Uh, since I've never presented on the OptiWall, can we bring bring that up as, so that it go, goes top to bottom whenever we just have one picture? So this is a picture of Copernicus, um, and I'll explain why I've chosen this picture in a second. But I, what I want to talk about is the geopolitics of the commons. And the commons is something that uh, has a lot of different meanings depending on how you think about it. Uh, it's a phrase that goes back to the English, uh, sort of the, the, the first creation of fences in England that fenced off the actual physical commons. But I, I'm using it in the sense of the digital commons. And I'll talk about what I mean by that later. Um, in another way, what I'm talking about is in many ways the geopolitics of science, because that's where a lot of data politics begins. Uh, because science is a place where we've done more talking about data than we have in a lot of other places. And so there's a longer history of politics of data in science than in a lot of other places. And in the United States, that's in many ways the geopolitics of reductionism in data. Because uh, we've been since the Manhattan Project and Vannevar Bush's sort of legendary memos that kicked off U.S. science policy, we've been reducing things to their component parts as, as a policy. And it's been very effective um, in spaces and problems that are susceptible to reductionist approaches. And so I was beautifully set up by the previous talk, uh, thankfully. Um, but I'm arguing that we're entering a period of emerging systems problems as opposed to reductionist problems. And emerging systems problems are actually quite resistant to reductionist approaches. And uh, whether it's climate or health or network engineering or international politics in a globalized world, um, data is actually part of the transformation from reductionist to emergent because systems that we used to think we could reduce turn out to be complicated and emergent when, when we get enough data about them. And so, so that's sort of the context for this. Now, the reason I've chosen a picture of Copernicus is first that it's a photograph. It's a cultural object. It's a creative work under the law. It's a composition covered by copyright, which is a powerful international <laughs> regime. Um, that is uh, quite old compared to a lot of other international regimes. Whoever took this photograph, uh, the, the copyright, if, if he or she were an American, would last 70 years after his or her death. And that is to encourage the creation of more works, which is ironic given that if you're dead, you can't create more works. Right, this is a law created by institutions that used to be able to control the distribution and production of the creative works. And so it benefits the incredibly small percentage of works that have economic value that endures beyond their deaths. So Casablanca still makes money for the motion picture studio that owns it, even though it is an incredibly old film. And so the old institutional players that advise Congress, as, in, as we, we heard from Peter, have been advising that it is necessary to create incentives in order for there to be new creative works. But the marginal cost of producing and distributing this photograph are very different than they were 25 years ago. Right? I bought this on iStock Photo for $10. Uh, it gives me all the rights I need to do anything I want. If I could have found a free one under a Creative Commons license, I would have, but I couldn't find one that would scale beautifully on the Opti portal. Right? But it, since it's digital, right, it's also data. Right? This is actually composed of ones and zeros. So at some level, this creative work has been reduced to data in a way that is fundamentally weird and not very human. And we're not really dealing with that. Um, and it can be copied, distributed at zero loss of quality or resolution. Now, at a scientific level, Copernicus developed the theory of heliocentrism. Um, and if we can go ahead to the next, the next folder. Um, Copernican theory right, was actually really a theory. It wasn't data oriented. He didn't look at data and observations and then derive. I'm trying to do mosaics here, so we'll see if they actually come together. 
Um, but these are the kinds of things that came after Copernicus, right? So these are the kinds of data that Brahe and Kepler created that actually proved the theory that the Earth did revolve around the Sun and that the Sun itself also moved, right? So this is what data used to look like, and this is how we used to start to use it effectively, is we would build models. And in the early days, models were just maps, right? We would draw things out, and they would be models, and they would be maps. And this actually was a place where observations and data actually transformed geopolitics. It, it really threatened the Roman Catholic Church to have the idea that the, these old ideas that the Earth was the center of the universe were being proven systematically through observation to be wrong. And it was a real threat to the politics of the nation states of the time, such as they were. And it led to the emergence of the journals. So the picture of the gentleman there, uh, his name is Henry Oldenburg. He was reading the letters that people were using to circulate the knowledge of the observations of the time. And he invented the idea of the journal. And that's the first journal ever, right, from the, uh, f the, the proceedings uh, and transactions of the, Royal, of the Philosophical Society of London. Right? Um, now, all of this stuff... It has basically transformed the way that we distributed and moved knowledge around the world because it created this idea, first, that we would make observations about the world that we live in, we would quantify it. Second, that we would build models out of those things that we quantified, maps. And third, that we would distribute those things, that they would be actually moved around. So can we move to the next set of slides? And I would encourage you to remember that the, the data we have at the moment typically gets us a very wrong future. So it's, we can be right about some things, and these are some beautiful images. Um, some of these are, are from actually a French, National French Library exhibit on Paleo Future, and these are from 1910, imagining what the world would look like in the year 2000. And so the data that we have is something that we fit into the worldview that we have. And so when we do futurism in science fiction, it tells us a lot more about our moment now, in many cases, than it does about the future that we're going to wind up in. And so the problem is, is that the policies that we create last far beyond the proof that we were wrong about the future. And copyright is a great example of that. The last major revision to the Copyright Act uh, was 1976. We extended the length of copyright in 1996. I actually was on the Hill during that. It's called the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act uh, after Sonny Bono. Uh, but so you can imagine when you build politics based on projections like this, the politics endures far beyond the projections being proven wrong. And I would argue that a lot of the assumptions we're making about data are vastly optimistic um, they're not necessarily uh, wrong. I just think they're over-optimistic in terms of their beneficence. And so encoding them into a politics is going to have some, some unintended consequences. Uh, and I would encourage you to go look at, these, at these, this, this French set of exhibits. They're credited to um, Villemar. And uh, it, there's just beautiful stuff on the Paleo Future blog. You can, I got lost for like a half a day um, choosing uh, files for this presentation. Um, let's go to the next set, please which should just be one. Should just be one? And at some, uh, no. Okay, it's fine. Oh, no, no yeah, well, yeah, this is right, that's right. Um, so, so these are all ways that we wound up storing data, right? So going from the forms of knowledge distribution, right? This is, a, you know, uh, looking for pictures of eight tracks and vinyls and journals. These were all different ways that we either observed with the telescope or we actually stored and communicated data. And it goes from the very old uh, books um, to, you know, copying machines and journals. And, and, and eight tracks were actually really a big deal when I was a kid, <laughs> right? The quality was so much better than, than some of the other methods that were available. And these were all the sort of very tail end of the digital age of ways of copying and distributing. And they were, in many ways, human. Right? When we made copies of these things, they degraded. You know, I was a, a, a dead taper. I was starting to show my age, right? And I would have these analog copies, and you would actually label what generation your tape was. So it would tell you how far away you were from the master. And there was competition to get second generation analog copies of things because the fourth and the fifth generation tapes had so much hiss and degradation that they almost weren't very good, right? But that was a human property, right? Because when we copy ourselves, we change and we degrade a little bit. And we degrade as we get older. 
And that's not something that we associate with truly digital data. So the thing that I noticed when I was working at, at Creative Commons is this transition to digital, right? And I chose this to try to represent it um, because we're repurposing signs and signals from an analog world. And in many cases, we map them one-to-one -to, -one to a digital world, right? Scientists still publish what they call papers and what they call journals on monthly bases and respond to each other with letters to the editor. Right? It is a profoundly analog thing that has simply been digitized. It has not been made digital. And so the politics of science, the politics of funding science, have basically just replaced analog distribution systems with di digital distribution systems. But the fundamental politics of science haven't really changed at all. Right? They're changing in places like here. But if you go to the NIH, right, it doesn't look very different except for the fact that they use email instead of facts. So let's move on. Now, the, we've heard about this already today, so I'm not going to get too far into it. Um, if you can pull up, especially there's one of Pigpen saying, hey, that's the one I really want to pull up. There we go, down there on the left. Right. This is what I unfortunately think of as our embrace of, of data. Right. So when I th the, Ben sent this paper out before the, 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 the session called Everything is Secrete, and it referred to Larry's poo at the end. Um, and it had this idea that we're basically secreting data everywhere we go. And as I read it, I just had this vision of Pigpen from Peanuts, because um, he throws off dirt everywhere he goes. And every device we carry, whether it's a Fitbit or a phone or cheek swabs, right, spits off data. And that's very different from the Large Hadron Collider over there uh, at CERN, which is what most people think about when they think about big data. It's these big things that we create. But this is sort of the naive attitude that people seem to have about how awesome data is going to be. It's we look at, we, we have this, all this data coming off us, and hey, I'm not going to have cancer anymore. And that's not true. Right? We're going to keep getting sick. And if we don't come up with a different way to deal with the data that we've got, we're unlikely to be able to use it the way we want to. And so this is my downer slide. It's, it's really nice. I, I put all this together earlier in the week. And, and what's nice is that it's, a lot of this has been set up by the previous speakers. So we had this thing in the United States called the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. And if you don't know American history, you probably haven't seen any of these photographs. So let's get them all as big as we can. Um, the Dust Bowl happened when the US government, during a period of unusual rain in the Great Plains part of this country, Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and some other places, encouraged people to go rip up the topsoil and plant cotton and other staple crops. These were grasslands that had been there for tens of thousands of years, stable and drought resistant. And because it rained really unusually for like 30 years, we thought that this was going to become a, a new breadbasket. And what happened is the farmers planted so much, and we had no idea what to do when we, when we planted in those days, that the topsoil disappeared. And when the regular drought cycles returned, and the winds that are native to that part of the land came, right? the Dust Bowl came, and it, it snowed red snow in Boston, which was a long way from Arkansas and Oklahoma as a result of this. And so what I'm worried about is a Dust Bowl of data coming after us. Um, and there was this politics of exploitation of the land that led to this Dust Bowl. And I, I worry that we're heading into a politics of exploitation of data um, in a way that is, is very Facebook-y, um, that is very much googly, um, which does, which is sort of ignorant of the longer term cycles that we may be running into. And so uh, this idea that rain follows the plow was the core idea behind the policies that led to the dust bowl, right? So if you go plow it, the rain will come. And I think if you measure it, the answer will come is another is a very similar assumption. Now, I do believe deeply in measurement and quantification. I use all of the devices um, for my own good. Uh, but one of the reasons I do what I do for a living is that I think that we have to have some other methodologies to avoid dust bowl impacts from, from being able to measure everything. And, it, and the important thing is that this had a devastating impact on people, on the economy, and on the land. It was the largest migration in American history came out of the Dust Bowl because people just had to leave. And a third of them weren't farmers. A third of them were professional white-collar workers. Um, 
and you can go ahead and go on to, to, to section eight. Um, so the, the, the geopolitics that I would argue that we're getting, right, without intervention, are, 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 is a trio. So first is, a, is the geopolitics of the digital divide, right? So the, the picture of the Earth at night, it's actually a pretty good representation of where technology spread is. And so the capacity to exploit data is as unevenly distributed as the capacity to generate data. And so I think we're heading towards a digital divide in which the people who can use data are going to rapidly accelerate in their capacity to make choices um, compared to people who can't exploit data. And so that's one geopolitics that we're going to get without intervention is um, there's going to be an increasing distance between people know how, who know how to exploit data and people who don't. And increasingly, the people who do know how to exploit data will be able to measure those who don't know how to exploit it. And that will, again, intensify the divide. Um, the other kind of politics that we're getting is a monoculture politics. So what, what you get inside Facebook and some of these other systems is a monoculture of data. It's data that is sort of uniform, but it's inside a company. It has a czar. It's in a controlled environment. Right. And that's very attractive to those in power because it's something where you have someone you can negotiate with. Right? Ari Emanuel is a famous Hollywood agent, you know, said recently after the SOPA debacle, he's like, tell me who to meet with to fix piracy. And my favorite answer was this guy who writes for The Verge. He says, well, I work on the internet, right? And you can meet with us whenever you'd like. Right? We're here. Um, and, and the third is, is the black box transaction, which is really the, 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 the corporate reaction to all of this, is to say, listen, give us your data, we'll put it on a black box, you'll be private, you'll be safe. We won't give you a copy because you might not do something smart with it. You might leave it on a USB key on a bus. You don't know what to do with it anyway. Trust us. We don't need to show you. So this is what I, th when I think about what we're getting without intervention, it's these three things. We can go on to 11. Sorry, to 10. 10, my bad. So the trick is that we can actually build our own politics without asking for anyone's permission. Now, some of this is, uh, used to be thought to be criminal, right? So we're going to infringe copyright. Uh, I have been accused, as have others in my world, of being a communist. Right? That's not an insult to some of the people in this room. Um, I'm not a communist, right? I believe in this thing called the commons, which is, in fact, very different from communism. But this is the sort of label that we get. I remember taking a taxi to the airport once and hearing the then head of the MPAA say that there are these modern day communists who advocate for the creation of a digital commons in which materials are available for free on the internet with no controls. And so we are labeled often with the propaganda of the revolution, but we actually um, are talking about something that is commonly built, not something that is centrally planned. That's this the fundamental distinction between Sovietism and, and what I'm talking about is what I'm advocating for is something that is actually built of small parts loosely joined and voluntary. Let's go on to the next one. And this goes to, to, to Ben's introduction, which is that the, the laws that we have and the politics that we have often dictate no public access as a default. So copyright says in the absence of a license, you cannot copy, distribute, display, or publicly perform a work. Right, so the default is no public access. And this made sense when you had to have a business devoted to the production and distribution of goods. Right? It was a monopoly right that made economic sense when you had to create that incentive. But when those economics change and the laws don't, we wind up in a pretty screwy situation. And that's where we are right now. We're in a world where for copyrightable works, the default rule is no public access. We're in a world where the companies that are controlling the vast majority of our data generation are basically implementing copyright via terms of use, right? But even, it's even less good than copyright. Copyright at least accrues to you as the creator. When you use a Facebook-style system, when you use 23andMe and all these other systems, they own your data, right? You don't even have your own rights. And this is why data portability, I was so happy to hear it brought up in the first panel, because the idea that you own your data, or at least the right to a copy of your data, if not the canonical copy of your data, is the key to building a geopolitics that's a little bit different. Right? And so the opposite of no public access is the concept of a public right of way. And that's really what the commons is about. 
So if there's a public right of way in the United States, we have an extensive trail system. I, I grew up on the edge of the Appalachian Trail in East Tennessee. It's common public access. I don't have to ask permission to hike the Appalachian Trail of anyone, right? And it cuts across private property. There are voluntary easements made to that private property to create that public access. And that's what a digital commons is all about. So I spent most of the last 10 years of my life working on making it easy to share things through legal or technical means at Creative Commons, the World Wide Web Consortium. And it's part of a continuum from free software, which was really the invention of the idea that you could take this powerful property right and invert it in a way that guaranteed public access by default instead of restricting it by default. And Creative Commons took that and extended that to cultural works, non-software works, photographs, text, video. And at the same time that Creative Commons emerged, you had this explosion in the capacity to capture creative works. You had digital cameras, digital video cameras, blogging software, wiki software. All of these were technologies that suddenly changed the, the difficulty of capturing a creative work. It's still hard to write a book. It's still hard to record a CD, right? It's still hard to compose a symphony. You don't see a lot of those kind of works under Creative Commons licenses. But capturable works, things that you can capture with technology in the flick of a moment, right? those are things that are actually very, very good for the commons. And they're having these weird economic impacts on businesses that were based on purity of content. So stock photography is something that is increasingly eroded by the fact that there are, I think the last check, 300 million Creative Commons licensed photographs on Flickr alone. And even if the percentage of people who can take a decent photograph doesn't change, if the raw number of people taking photographs and sharing them goes up, and a small percentage of those people share, then eventually you have a critical mass of photos that don't suck, that are free. So the number of artists in the world is not likely to change, right? Most artists are still gonna suck, right? My painting is terrible, right? But if everyone in the world has the capacity to create art, and they do, because the technology allows them, and they share, then you begin to radically change the economics of art. And so the question is, does the capacity to generate and capture data, which I would argue is undergoing an even more radical drop in cost, as Larry pointed out, right, does that create the same change in politics of science? And I spent you know, years working on this at CC. We found that the scientific literature is something that should be susceptible to a commons-based approach, especially given that it's taxpayer-funded. Right? We should be able to read the things our tax dollars pay for. Um, if 1,000 people read a paper on APOE4 and 999 do not understand it, I don't care. What I care is that Larry gets access to it and he understands it. Right? Or my son, who's a year old, when he's 15, gets access to that paper. Because in that one moment, you've actually created something very much like a scientist without having to go through a credentialing process, just like digital cameras create photographers without having to go through photography training classes. Now, there are other ways, places we can build commonses, and I'm, I'm working on these now in the privacy rights space. Privacy rights look an awful lot like copyrights. They come down from the government. They cost nothing for the individual to acquire. They're automatic. They're very unlike property rights around physical things like stem cells or property rights around patents. Right? Anything that has a high marginal cost of production, high marginal cost of distribution, is perhaps not as susceptible to the digital commons politics as things that are innately free to move around. Um, but the commons is, is, is something like, if, you've, if you're a science fiction fan, I love William Gibson, and in his Bridge trilogy, he has this place called the Walled City on the internet, and it's, it's this thing built on a shared kill file. And it's a private space where everyone goes. The commons is like a translucent version of that. Instead of being built on a shared kill file, it's built on a, on, on a shared openness file. And so the, we can go ahead, the, the, the place where we are now with the commons is, right, is this, right? It's tiny, it's vulnerable, right? And it's just barely coming out of the ground. We really have no idea what the commons is going to lead to. Most of the stuff on the commons is the equivalent of cat pages and blink tags. Right? We're, we're the web 1995 when it comes to the commons. But what we can learn is that the asymmetry between creation and production of goods that, was, that we've always had, right? companies, a small number of people have always made goods that were distributed to a lot more people who consumed them. But that same math works for us 
in our advantage when it comes to sharing, which is that a small number of us sharing can create Wikipedia. A small number of us sharing can create the Apache web server. And a small number of us being like Larry and measuring ourselves and sharing can create enough data to be radically disruptive of the traditional data systems. And in fact, they, we can make open systems completely competitive with closed ones. Next picture. So what I'm, what I'm working on now is a system that lets people donate their data to science. And uh, I'm not showing it to you because it's really ugly. And instead, I'm showing you pictures of where I think we are metaphorically, uh, which is we are beginning to demonstrate that it is possible to donate your data to science. Right? We're testing the hypothesis that informed consent can be created online without doctors, that people have data about themselves that's useful, and that we can actually move it that we can actually move it to scientists. Um, and we're probably going to fail a lot, and that's actually really good. Right? The more that we fail, the better. So I'm going to close uh, just with, a, with, a, with, with one last thought, which is that the lines are blurring. Right? So these are all photographs from NASA. And the one on the bottom left, actually, is one that, that we're blowing up and putting on the wall in my house because it's beautiful. And when I ran across it, I didn't really know what it was. I had no idea it was science. I thought it was art. And so we're going to start to see a radical blurring of the lines as science gets more able to visualize the things inside us. And are they art? Are they data? Right? And does it matter? Right? Because the problem is that our politics thinks it does matter. Right? This version of the photograph is, co is a copyrightable work, even though it emerges from data gathered from the Galileo satellite. So the politics have completely not kept up. Last, last one, please. So when, when, when Ben asked me to talk about the geopolitics of data, I, I, I think of it as a geopolitics of emergence. And what I like about the commons is it's a transnational way for small groups of us who don't like the, the countervailing orthodoxy to work together. We share a common set of norms. We encode them in a standard set of legal tools that are recognized by the various nation states in which they exist. And we build a thing that just works. And what's fascinating is the number of governments that are beginning to pay attention to this and saying, maybe we should simply watch what these you know, modern day communists are doing and see if we can learn from them. Because I believe that we have to have a politics that's as flexible as the sorts of systems that we're trying to study. Because the, we, we, what we have seen is that analog political choices radically limit our digital ability to create without, without breaking the law. And so I am a, the kind of person who doesn't like breaking the law if I don't have to. So what I would argue is that this is, this is the fundamental question, is how do we design a politics of data that's in turn a politics for emergence? Thanks. <laughs>